just we just don't want to, to make a mess. Welcome to the assembled dignitaries, guests, 
and family members of the staff of Force Institute. Before we begin, once again, a gentle reminder to make sure that no phone rings during the proceedings. Today, we have gathered to celebrate the 107th Foundation Day of Bose Institute, which is also the 165th birth anniversary of its founder, Acharya Jagadish Chandra Bose, who was born in 1858. The erudite Acharya straddled the diverse academic spheres of physics and biology with equal ease. On his 60th birthday in 1917, he established this institute with the aim of advancement of science and the diffusion of knowledge. Each year, the entire Bose Institute community comes together to commemorate this auspicious occasion with a memorial lecture in the name of Tajaji. As per our tradition, we will begin today's program with an invocation that was specially written by Dacharya's dear friend, the famous poet Kobi Guru Rabindranath in 1917 to mark the foundation of Bose Institute. You will be hearing a recorded version of the song. <laughs> The 
84. The 84th Acharya J.C. Bose Memorial Lecture will be delivered by the eminent experimental particle physicist, Professor Paolo Guadalino. Professor Guadalino is currently the Joint Scientific Managing Director of the Facility for Antiproton and Ion Research at the GSI Helmholtz Center for Heavy Ion Research. He is also a faculty member of the Institute of Nuclear Physics of the Technical University, Darmstadt. I request Professor Guadalino to kindly come up to stage. He will be greeted with a floral bow. I now request Professor Uda Longbathai, Director of Both Institute, to kindly come up on stage. Professor Bondupathai will also be welcomed with a floral bouquet. Our dignitaries will now light the ceremonial lamp. Professor Udal Bhagavatai, Director of Bose Institute, to kindly deliver his welcome address and present the Director's report. Good afternoon. Professor Dr. Paolo Giulio. Scientific Managing Director, Facility for Antiproton and Ion Research, Darmstadt, Germany. Mr. George Lorock, the Technical Managing Director, Fair, Darmstadt, Germany. Distinguished guests, ladies, gentlemen, my dear colleagues and scholars. It's my privilege to welcome you all on this auspicious occasion of 107th Foundation Day of our prestigious institution. On behalf of all my colleagues of both institute, I extend a very warm welcome to you all. We have assembled here in this solemn occasion to pay tribute to the legendary scientists who paved the foundation of modern science, not only in India, but also in the Asian subcontinent. I'd like to reiterate that Sir J.C. Rose believed in seamless science and not interested to give a fencing or boundary between and among sciences. 
he advocated the further and fuller investigations of many ever opening problems of natural science, which includes both life and non life. He also opined that the lines of physics, of physiology, and of psychology converge and meet. Though to seek oneness among many people here, it is that genius of India should find its true blossoms. I like to mention the major or the most significant contribution of Satish Ghosh. Although you are very much aware of it, the more you will listen, then you will understand the gravity of the science he introduced to the world. He is the father of wireless communication in the world because of his pioneering work in the discovery of millimeter wave, which paved the way for radio communications and modern microwave technology, ranging from radar to telephone. Both discovered the first use of what is now known as semiconductor device, which in turn eventually gave rise to solid state diodes and transistors. He was the first to initiate the use of physics based instruments to probe the properties of biological systems, did pioneering research on the electrical responses of plants that making their way making seminal discoveries in plant electrophysiology, which heralded the advent of the discipline biophysics. That's why he is considered to be the father of biophysics in India, rather in the Asian subcontinent. He invented a unique apparatus named Prescograph, which can magnify the growth of plants by a factor of 10,000. Being a physicist, really it's a marvelous job. He discovered a unique photosynthetic pathway which utilizes merit. He has also anticipated the present day cybernetics thought through his plant models of memory as an information storage device and did painstaking research on responses of plants under stimuli and gave the foundation of the subject called plant intelligence. That is why he is also considered to be the father of plant neurobiology. Now, it is customary to place before you the annual performance of Oak Institute 2022 by the city. I take pleasure to mention that both Institute has always been taking proposals both to achieve success in research and create an international impact in the areas of high energy physics, understanding soft atomic particles, quantum information and communications, understanding responses of plants and the biological and abiotic state system and synthetic biology, environmental and microbiology, and climate change. Structure and functions of macromolecules, bioinformatics, more organic chemistry for drug development, identification of drug targets and validation of bioactive molecules for therapeutic interventions, atmospheric dynamics, and air pollution. It is not worth it to mention that we are always catalyzing frontier research in the field of biomedical sciences and venturing to find out new molecules and targets for therapeutic interventions against life and diseases like. Cancer, Alzheimer, diabetes, infectious diseases like malaria and tuberculosis. I'm delighted to let you know that we have published 234 numbers of full length peer reviewed research papers in research journals, two books, 33 chapters in books, and 12 papers in conferences during the year 2022 and 2023. In addition, 29 PhD students have been produced and 47 research mentors, other than PhD, have been trained who are successfully living their professional lives all over the globe. It is praiseworthy to mention that more than 35 numbers of lectures, seminars, symposiums, colloquium, ordinance, authored by both institutes during 2023. I am also delighted to enumerate the following high value mega projects of both institutes, which gives the signature to this institute for international recognition and responsibilities, which are as follows India's participation. In the construction of facility for anti proton and ion research, we are advanced researchers. We have been fulfilling our commitment in overseeing the designing, manufacturing, and supply of in kinds, for instance, man, power converters, beam stopper, etc., and accelerator and coordinate participation of Indian scientists in experiments at Fair Germany. Indian participation in the Alice experiment at Sal, a large ion collider experiment at Alice 
a dedicated TV ion collision experiment at Large Hadron Collider in Asia saw Switzerland for the understanding of physics of strongly interacting metals that with high energy densities. The National Clean Air Program, in fact, the Minister of Environment, strategic action plans to mitigate air pollution statewide, both institutes and local institutes. Really, it's a good news for us. Quantum science. We are trying our refuges to crystallize the project on quantum communications, quantum network, and quantum computations under the banner of national vision of quantum science and technology of government of India. After long efforts and expectations, a remarkable statue of Acharya Gaudi Chandrapur, made by the renowned sculptor Sri Gautam Chandrapal in front of the main gate institute, has been erected. The statue was unveiled by the honorable chairman of both institute council, Dr. Gautam Artis. A notable number of visits of students accompanied by teachers from different schools, colleges, universities, government organizations, and the different ministries have been successfully conducted by the institute fulfilling their very purposes and the way of diffusion of knowledge and making human resources who will dedicate their life for capturing science and propagating science that is mass media. I take pleasure also to mention that a significant number of global and national collaborations, more bipartite and tripartite with both institutes have been made. The institute is catalyzing all these international events in order to elevate the image of the country to a greater extent. The contribution of both institutes is acknowledged because of the evident presence of Professor Dr. Chubayi Nepalo, Scientific Managing Director, Facility for anti proton and Ion Research Care Council Chairman, and Mr. George Blog, Technical Managing Director, Facility for anti proton and Ion Research Group. Germany. It's really a great gesture of Professor Paolo Chuberino. Instead of his busy schedule, he has given concept to deliver a report, Acharya Jesi Book Memorial Lecture, titled India and Big Science, a success path for the 21st century. Today, on the occasion of the Government of 107 Foundation Day of Both Institute, I'm also thankful to Mr. George Blog, which uh, 84 Acharya Jesi Book Memorial Lecture. As well as beside over the farmers and their growth. We all are facing obstructions and problems while generating knowledge, creating facility, and translating knowledge into technology. To them, I would like to mention the famous, inspiring quote of Acharya J.C. Ghosh. Probably it will be also helpful to George and Paolo. So, constantly facing the problem to make the facility the reality. So, the inspiring thought. Inspiring quote I'd like to mention the more difficult is the task, the greater is the challenge. When you have gained the vision of purpose to which you can and must dedicate yourself wholly, then the closed door will be open and seemingly impossible will become fully attainable. Thanks and enjoy the lectures. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya. May I request Professor Shandar Bush, the Chair of the Foundation Day Committee at Bose Institute, to kindly introduce today's speaker, Professor Paolo Dribblino, and also the Chairman, Mr. Jörg Lauro. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is really a, a pleasant task to introduce uh, a person like Paolo Givalino and George Dorak. I know him for some time, but it is also difficult, you know. So, introduce both of them properly, it will take one lecture hour, I suppose, but I have to you know, summarize everything. So, Paolo is an experimental. Accomplished experimental scientist, renowned for his work in high energy nuclear collision, particularly focused on creating the conditions akin to the early moments of the universe, featuring as a dreams and hot matter. Paolo's academic journey commenced with studies at Pune University 
at the University of California in Santa Cruz, providing the foundation for his involvement in heavy iron experiments at CERN in Switzerland. Since the early 1990s, Paul Giovanino has held several senior positions at CERN's Alice experiment, within the Alice collaboration comprising 1,600 scientists from 169 institutions across 42 countries. He has held several significant roles and eventually was elected to lead the collaboration from January 1st, 2011. In addition to his five year work in nuclear physics, Professor Juvenino has made remarkable strides in the development of particle detection techniques, technology, serving as a member of the instrumentation panel of the International Committee for Future Accelerator since August 2000. Beyond his scientific contributions, Professor Juvenino has served in many scientific committees and advisory panels across all over the world. For example, in China, the Czech Republic, France, Germany, Italy, Korea, Japan, Mexico, Russia, and several other countries, including South Africa and Spain. He also participated in the International Advisory Committees of numerous scientific conferences. Throughout his career, he, he, he has a very you know, very personal relations with India, and he has in his career, he has visited India numerous times with, for scientific collaboration. Since to January 2017, Paolo has assumed the role of Joint Scientific Managing Director at GSI Nilmo uh, Center for Heavy Iron and Specialty for anti proton Ion and Ether, which we in short call here, where his research remains steadfastly focused on high energy heavy ion collisions and the matter they produce. GSI is one of the world's renowned nuclear physics laboratories, home of many scientific discoveries including six of the elements in the periodic table. There is a new international laboratory currently under construction, one of the largest new scientific facilities in the world. India is among the founding members of the pair and is third largest shareholder. Presently, 27 Indian institutes participate in the pair with both institutes in the leading role. Throughout his career, Paolo has garnered numerous honors, including two honorary Called the Doctor, the Lisbeth Maitner Prize of the European Physical Society, and the Enrico Fermi Prize, the highest honor from the Italian Physical Society, 2013. In 2012, he was honored with the title Commendatore della Repubblica Italiana by the Italian President for his scientific contribution. This is the Italian equivalent of British knighthood. Paolo says he doesn't like to be called Commendatore. He was elected into the Academia Europea for his exceptional scientific achievement. He, along with George Blanc, who is the chairperson of chairman of the talk and the presiding will be presiding over today's event, are basically sort of giving us hope. The whole nuclear physics community who are looking forward to this unique facility that we call Pier. And he, despite this difficult time, uh, except the who are doing an excellent job of keeping our hope alive. And George, since the beginning of 2016, now to the eight years, he's, he is serving as a technical managing director of GSI. He's the first technical advisory joint technical managing director of the GSI, Helmut Center for Heavy Iron, and the PR facility for IT for our iron research. George Dorr, by profession, a mechanical engineer. He studied engineering, engineering at the Helmut Schmidt University in Hamburg. And after that, he served for 12 years in the Army, German Army. Previously, before FAIR, he was responsible for the realization of large scale technical systems in international plant construction business over 20 years worldwide. From planning to the procurement of components, assembly, and submission to the current uh, handover. To, Project to, to the end customer. He implemented large petrochemical production systems, large conventional power plants for electricity generators, and this includes several projects in India, uh, such as Nigel Power Plant. So, in a sense, actually, uh, George perhaps has traveled across India much more than me. That was I gather from conversation with him. So, let me once more uh, welcome both of our guests. 
कैंसिल सर बोथ ऑफ योर प्रेजेंस एंड दैट वी आर रियल पब्लिकली डिस्पाइट दिस इज शेड्यूल यू आर हियर सो वी विल नाउ मूव ओवर टू द एक्चुअल टॉक थैंक यू in the one in Darjeeling, 
by a group of friends around uh, the charismatic figure of uh, Professor Lisa Sigma, who developed the very first ideas that eventually have become fair. And uh, I think so it is particularly appropriate that in a memorial day in which we look also back at what has brought us to what we are today, we remember that this group of people discussing, creating a dream, followed through. This was uh, in the past millennium. Eh? Uh, it took a long time. Uh, these projects have to have to mature and then uh, convince people and so on. But now you will see the very end of, uh, of today's presentation with the year showing you how it is being built now. So if let, let's uh, see, but uh, I would like to spend then a couple of boring words about why does one need big science project? What is you, you know there is this general term big science we are big science and uh, they are of course unique opportunities and when, when you want to have great goals well you typically need large instruments uh, the small ones were already done a long time ago and the, the further you want to travel uh, in your exploration of the universe and of its history uh, the more complex and larger the instruments that you need. And that, of course, comes to big science. They produce it as a second, there's always three pillars in the existence of such facilities. Pillar number one, science, knowledge. We which is, by the way, what characterizes us as human beings. We want to know our place in the universe. We want to know what, what are we doing here? How are we creating? What, what makes us? And what, how does everything around us work? The second one, though, is as important. They produce technology of enormous social impact. And we will see that in, in, the, in, the, in the rest of the presentation. And the other thing, I am delighted to see so many young people here. Um, the third and probably most important role is to provide a very special environment for young people to grow their talents. And why? Because they are exposed to the advanced technologies, because they are working for the frontier science but also because they work in an international environment where different ways of thinking, different ways of working, get together, have to find a way to work together, have to find a way to uh, progress together. And it's a, a phenomenal uh, way of learning. All these three things, though, are, are confronted with the enormous complexity and enormous a variety of problems in realizing such a such experiment in such facilities. And the only answer to that is international cooperation, is when different countries come together, not just bringing money, that is the least important thing, bringing their know how, bringing their technologies, bringing their brains together. And that is what then finally uh, makes this all possible. And, uh, and then, how does this work? I don't, don't bother reading any of that. Uh, the, uh, it's what <laughs> Americans like to call a global system. But that is really the word that describes the reality. It is global. You have people ideas, institutions which come from all over the world, which get together. But then in each individual institution, they at Bono, at, at BCC, at Ireland, at uh, uh, Tokyo, and so on and so forth, there are persons in their own institutions which develop ideas, which develop technologies, 
which discuss them with all the others in this back and forth between the local reality in the home institute with maybe sometimes small groups of a professor with a few students or sometimes huge institutions but they all bring their piece of imagine a, uh, one of the huge temples uh, with many 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 statues for example you know each one of the artists who created one of these statues gave a unique contribution to the overall temple that is the same situation here if you have an overall temple to build and everyone bring his or her own special tool special technology special imagination special talent and then back and forth together it is experiment then you come home analyze the data again in your in your home institution developing and so on and so forth always remembering that science is done by people is done by brains and this uh, it was again a quote i was having in another page <laughs> Uh, that I, I, I changed with the other one from from Moses it's in the brain that uh, uh, the discovery happens and so our most important product is to be talent factory to create the opportunity for the young people to blossom to realize their talents I mean we provide an environment they are the talent and that is what what in the end uh, can contribute to the advancement of society as a whole society needs people which have ideas which have in, which have learned how to turn ideas into reality so India has a number of participations in large-scale infrastructure but one should look at this and see that although they are numerous they follow a well-defined unified idea and you can see it here there is the observation of the universe and the observation of the universe you do through telescopes you do through neutrino telescopes, you do through optical telescopes, different instruments which look at the universe in the traditional way we are used to, and then the new, maybe the way the way of looking at the universe to another type of uh, ways, the, the, the gravitational waves. And then you have the accelerator uh, uh, laboratories, CERN and FAIR, where you reproduce the phenomena that you looked at in the universe in the laboratory going for on one side and serve to the highest possible energies and and here for the highest possible intensity this maybe we just clarify immediately because uh, it's the question i receive almost every time i talk to somebody since i have worked most of my life at CERN, and I am working at FAIR, and people ask me, what's the difference? How do the things relate? And uh, it's actually fairly easy to imagine, because what do we do? We look at things. This is the basic experiment we do all the time. We take a, so a source of particles that light up there, produces photons, the photons come, they interact with this object, by the object I'm studying, and then I record the uh, products of the interaction with my detector, which is my eye, and then I process it in my computer center, which is up here. And from that, from the analysis of the effects of the interaction of my particles with my target with my object detected by my detector i understand that this is what it is now if i want to go towards more detail 
I have two paths, which are October. I have two different paths. Either I want to go to smaller and smaller details, then I would want to have a probe of higher and higher energy. Try to imagine, instead of using a light, I would use X-rays, then I have a radiography, then I can use higher and higher energy particles, and I go to smaller and smaller and smaller scale. That's a, that's a path, and that's the path which is CERN is following. And then there is the path which we are following, that is, I want to still look at collective properties, at the whole object in one go. But I want to look at it better. So what I do, I increase the lights. I turn on more lights. And this is called increasing the luminosity. It's actually the word that is used, the technical term in, in accelerator science, is the luminosity of the accelerator, uh, which means that I accelerate more and more particles. And that's what we do. And this is the other path in which then I turn on all the lights and I see much better uh, how my object looks like in its global properties. Then you take these things and you look at this last one here. You want to produce energy. And the thing you want to do is to imitate the universe. So you imitate the stars and you try to do fusion of nuclei. And this uh, and that is of course the nuclear process. So you need the knowledge which comes from nuclear physics you, you to imitate the universe in producing in producing energy. All these are very large scale infrastructures, but you see that there is a coherence in what India is doing. They are not just doing any large scale infrastructure, there's many around in the world. Uh, they have selected through many years uh, of different projects involving the, the understanding and so on, a group that has a coherent ability to work together and to produce, uh, produce uh, results. And this is particularly true now. Uh, this is a special moment. I mean, um, I have been the scientific director at FAIR for seven years. And I can tell you, the world has changed dramatically in this, in this seven years. And it's changed on one side for what is our vision of the role of nuclear physics in, in knowledge, and on the other in technologies and applications. We, we, let's first start with knowledge. What has happened in the last few years? It has happened that our friends, that by the way are the ones that we were mentioning before, the two observation of the universe, have made enormous progress. Enormous progress because they have opened new windows, observing phenomena that were not observed before, for example, the gravitational waves, the new neutrinos coming from from the universe, or have made dramatically improved instruments with uh, now uh, they, it's all, we've all been observing all the well, images from the Webb telescope or with uh, from the new uh, telescope on Earth. What though you don't see immediately is that the there is a, a deeper jump. And the fact that we have started in the last few years to be able to look at different <coughs> aspects from the same source at the same time, doing what is called multi-messenger astronomy. You have an event in the universe, for example, the, the example is a merger of of the neutron stars, and then you observe the gravitational waves emitted, the light, the radio waves. You will have a number of messages that you can put together. So, suddenly, in a few years, we have gone from individual, deep, separate observation to new windows, but also especially to look together 
at the same time as this value of freedom. And this is an immense step forward. But what is the implication of this? Let's go back to this image. What we see up in the sky are phenomena that are oftentimes nuclear processes or processes anyway in which nuclear processes have a big role. So in these few years, the demand from science as a whole of measurements in control conditions in the laboratory of nuclear processes have increased dramatically. So this triangle, nuclear physics, observation, and of course, the simulations, theory, and so on, has been rapidly growing in the last few years and is now giving a completely different view towards the universe. At the same time, there's been a dramatic change in our looking at nuclear physics in terms of our everyday life. The most extreme example is, of course, energy, because we all want carbon free energy. And, uh, well, uh, we have a number of uh, sources of wind, solar, and so on. But at the end of the day, you see that it is very hard to have any model that will provide the energy we need, not only today, but for the development in the, in the future years, uh, without a contribution from nuclear energy. And uh, moreover, from a contribution from innovation in nuclear energy, because of course, nuclear energy has, it has been having issues of safety, of uh, handling of waste, and so on and so forth. All things that nuclear physics can address. And of course, the big challenge for the future is to finally have nuclear fusion. And we have seen that is already playing a big role. But there are many other things. There are, uh, we'll try to skip a bit. Uh, there are many other things. We have a fundamental interplay between nuclear physics and medicine and biology which has again changed flavor in the last few years. The therapy of cancer with nuclear bees has been, which was established 25 years ago, actually in our laboratory, uh, has seen a renaissance of new developments in the last three or four years, completely new approaches. And we will see some of that. But the other thing, people have been now thinking, you all hear that every day, uh, of, the, of space travel as the next frontier. Space has been a bit forgotten for some time, and now suddenly, in the last few years, space has become, come back in full force in our dreams, and uh, in particular, long trips, colonies, going to Mars, and there, nuclear physics come back into the game because the number one issue of long presence of humans in space is radiation. And if we don't find mitigation measures and we don't understand the biological processes that are induced by radiation in great detail, there will be no way to actually either have a famous colony of Mars and so on and so forth. So, what do we do? We want to find answers to fundamental questions about the universe. And for that, we bring the universe in the laboratory. We create these conditions which determine the processes that are at the base of the evolution of the universe in the laboratory. So that's why we call ourselves uh, the universe in the lab, but it's not just a model. It's a uh, sort of laboratory, of course, but it is, it is actually a, a description of what we are doing. And I just want to give you a couple of examples of what is meant with this universe in the laboratory. One of the fundamental 
questions in science is uh, where do the elements come from? Where are cre the elements created? And uh, the answer is not an easy one. It's a complex answer. Uh, I will see with a colleague today some experiments on some of the element creation. There are many different processes that are addressed in different phases of the evolution of the universe, of the evolution of stars, and so on, that lead to the creation of the elements as, as we see them. Um, how, what is the structure of a neutron star? Well, it's a system of extremely high density of strongly interacting particles that, again, you can create in the laboratory and you can study. The planets, planetary science is a fascinating science. And then, as soon as you look at it a little bit, you would realize that, well, our knowledge of the structure of planets ends very near the surface of them. We know how they look from outside. <coughs> we know very little about the internal structures. Uh, imagine, for example, that uh, uh, if you calculate the pressure and so on, you would end up thinking that the water inside Jupiter is a metal and so on. Even the structure of the Earth under our feet is very poorly known given the pressure and density that are present. So, you know, this was a, a famous sentence. We are made of star stuff, of star dust. But it's again completely true. All of the elements which we have, apart from a handful, there are, this is the periodic table at the time of the Big Bang. Which we actually can even reproduce in the laboratory. At CERN, what we were doing in Alice was to create a small soup of quarks and gluons at extremely high temperature, very similar to what we would have just microseconds after the Big Bang, and then observe its evolution. <coughs> and in its evolution, we also create nuclei, a handful of very light ones. All of these richness of the table of the elements has happened through very many processes which happen throughout the life of stars of galaxies of yeah. neutron star mergers and so on um, and uh, i was mentioning before one of the great discoveries of the last few years has been one of the first materializations of this multi-messenger observation of the, of the universe when a merger of two neutron stars was observed in gravitational waves and then the following emission of light was measured in the observatories and from that one could infer that indeed heavy elements like gold and platinum were produced in the process and now we can in the laboratory Answer the question is that the probability of these, such as to produce the right amounts of, of the various nuclei, is this the dominant process and so on and so forth, and provide our friends which do gravitational waves, which do the observation of the universe, with the input they need for the interpretation of this data. But there are many, many such, uh, such uh, measurements. One, uh, that I particularly like is the fact that when Fowler got the Nobel Prize in 1983, so you know, 40 years ago, he indicated as one of the most interesting physics problems the measurement of the reaction uh, carbon plus helium going to oxygen. Why? Because those are the building blocks of life. We are made of carbon and oxygen. Where there is a general understanding that this happens in the late phase of life of giant red stars, yet the details of this process are uh, all to be studied and measured and there are a number of competing experiments that work on this fantastic subject, but we have, you know, 40 years have passed and still it's 
state, frontier uh, science states, and many, many others. Let's continue in this chain towards life. We build the carbon and oxygen. Then at some point you uh, want to know if you are capable of creating complex molecules that are the ones which then are the blocks on which we build life. And so what you do, you create uh, uh, crystals uh, which uh, uh, somehow mimic the astrophysical ice grains. You irradiate them with uh, 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 particles. It happens in, in space. And you go and look for complex molecules. And indeed, you find even amino acids. So you actually see life appearing through the very natural process of interaction of uh, uh, comic grains with grains of interstellar uh, ice. These are just some examples of the basic knowledge our, that you can obtain through this type of experiments. I must say, very much in the line of uh, uh, the way Bowden himself was working, uh, there's a lot of interdisciplinary approaches. He, we are a nuclear physics laboratory, yet the largest department in our institution is the bio one. Because in the end, we you see that many of the applications, many of the uh, uses of what, of the, what we do are actually in the realm of life science. But let's see, let's say there's a lot of applications. Let's look at some of them. Uh, one, which is in some sense obvious, is being in the, in the nature of this type of experiments all along, uh, is being the fact that experiments in physics have always been producing enormous amounts of data. That's always been the case. Uh, uh, growing with time, but always at the frontier of those who produce the most data. And that has induced in our community the need to develop algorithms, approaches to computing, new hardware. Uh, at GSI, we have, for example, developed the world's most energy efficient computer center. This is something we are very proud of. And it is essentially, if you need a lot of computing, then you also need to remove the heat, and that is a big factor in terms of sustainability of your system. But that, <clears throat> of course, so we call what we call, call green IT. And, but now there are the new ways uh, of quantum computing, of artificial intelligence, and so on that are starting to immediately get into the everyday life of our scientists that uh, use them in their uh, life. Another important thing. I was telling you about um, space, and I will come in a second. Let me just mention one thing here. Um, one of the many, many applications that you can think of um, are clocks. We, you know that uh, uh, the most precise clocks that one has around are atomic clocks, and they're extremely precise. And one could wonder, well, do I need any more precision? Well, take out your GPS from your phone, and uh, I'm sure you know that the precision of your localization depends on the time measurement. And this time measurement is determined by the precision of an atomic clock somewhere. And uh, you see, your precision is a few meters. Now, suppose you wanted to land an airplane, for example and uh, use GPS to land it, you wouldn't feel very safe with the something that knows how high you are by a few meters. So you want 70 meters. Uh, so you want 100 times better. And it's 100 times better you can obtain if you use a nuclear clock. But making a nuclear clock is a difficult thing. There's only one candidate possible at the moment, and we are in the process of measuring how that could be used. And uh, I was telling you, Space. Space is, is a fascinating thing because uh, when you look at what are the problems of going to Mars, for example, one or the first problem you see is radiation, cancer. Probability to 
developed cancer in going to Mars is several percent. Will be zero, could be ten percent. Imagine a crew going to Mars and developing one tenth of the people developing cancer. This is completely unacceptable. But as worse, uh, there are now studies that show that uh, your cognitive capabilities go down dramatically also. So you start thinking of uh, this uh, fantastic idea of, of space travel, and then you realize that uh, probably your crew arriving on, on, on Mars will have a number of sick people and everybody will be a bit down. That's not very, very good. So you have to find solutions. And that's not easy. Um, but there are ideas. Uh, if you go on the website of, of ASA, for example, you will find that there is a study that uh, uh, shows that uh, if you hibernate mice, they become much more resilient to the uh, effects of radiation. And guess who's done the study? We did. So the, the video is mostly played at, at, in our at the laboratory. So this is, uh, there is uh, maybe, it's still to be seen, but maybe the science fiction movies in which you see the uh, astronauts hibernated for the travel might actually be the real way it will happen and not to keep them young, but to keep them healthy. And uh, why is it so important that we do it? Because uh, if you look at uh, the biological effect of uh, the uh, uh, of the cosmic radiation, you will see that it is dominated by the um, heavy nuclei. Although they are few, you see, iron is much less uh, present than hydrogen nuclei, but still it is the dominant in terms of biological effects. And that is one of the subjects which are studied extensively. The first thing you want to do is to do on at the cellular level. Uh, an understanding of how damage to the DNA turn, uh, is generally repaired and sometimes not repaired, so that you understand the microscopic mechanisms that determine the damage from, from the DNA. So, and then you discovered that actually, although they are few, it is the heavy ones that dominate, and also that although the numbers decrease rapidly with energy, it is this region of to GEV, which is exactly where we work, the one which finally dominates the biological effect. So th this is what you have to do to understand. But there's many, many, many other applications. I will not uh, dwell into more, in, uh, most, but one that I find particularly uh, fascinating is that, uh, you, it, because it shows you how there is in science always also connections which are far away from one another. Some of our scientists, for experiments which we've not described now, uh, measure the characteristics of water in uh, extremely uh, low pressure and low temperature situations. So minus, at minus 43 degrees, you can have droplets of actual liquid water if you are low enough in pressure. And uh, this paper, that in which they also measured those characteristics and so on, had enormous resonance in a community which has nothing to do with it, which is the community of climate studies. Why? Because who studies droplets of water at low pressure, at extremely low temperature? People who study the formation of clouds. So you have that something that was done for a completely different purpose has then a big impact on the way we look at the cloud formation. Another thing that we have uh, been very proud of is the fact that we have developed uh, technologies for cancer therapy using nuclear beams. So this is a very simple image. Uh, many of you are biologists, you know better than that. But the point is, I want to irradiate the tumor which is deep inside the body if I to kill the cells. Uh, and what do I do? I, one typical thing is I use photos. But if I want to reach a depth of, say, 10 centimeters in the body, I will be irradiating the healthy tissues around it. 
much more than the ones of the tumor. So that's why you see there are these big objects which go around the body so that at least you distribute it uh, in all the healthy tissues around your, your, your tumor. But there is a more direct way of doing that. And it is exploiting the fact that if you use a nucleus to kill the cells, uh, it will deposit very little energy along its path, and most of it at the very end. This very end is determined by the energy. So you have a knob to fix the energy, and then you move with magnets in position your, your beam, and you are able very precisely to target a, uh, a tumor. And this will be extremely important when the tissue around the tumor is particularly pressure in the brain. In the eye, the spine. So uh, you have actually a tool which allows to intervene inside the body uh, at a well-defined position. By the way, about five more minutes, or how am I doing time-wise? How many times? How much time do I have? Okay, we will. It will do. So, um, you have a tool by which you can destroy cells in a well defined position inside the body. So, the idea imagine that you can have is well, actually a remote scalpel, again, like in science fiction movies. And uh, the idea that immediately some of our scientists had was well, let's try to do heart ablations with it so that instead of intervening on the heart, from outside, we go directly in and, and uh, make a cut in the, in, uh, in the heart. And it is being done with uh, the dozen of uh, pigs, and actually it worked. And uh, last year, uh, in uh, a, one of the many centers with which we collaborate, in Sardinia, in Italy, actually it was done in a human, and it worked. So you now have, and for special cases, of course, uh, the white reaction can be done also in, in a rather routine procedure, but in cases of people which have special conditions, you can actually act inside the heart from outside without opening the body. Not so bad. Uh, moreover, accelerators are everywhere, and this is why it's important to have laboratories which develop them. There are right now 17,000 accelerators of particles in the world. Of this, about 100 are used for particle nuclear physics. Almost nothing. Although they are all developed in these laboratories, all the others are used for many other things cancer therapy, semiconductor industry, welding, cutting, sterilization, and you name it. There's so many different uses. But this again means that <coughs> those who work in this field has a sort of responsibility towards humanity to continue developing these, but especially to produce experts that can operate them and can develop them, that can then work, go work in all the other places where they are used and know how to use them. So this is the one we are building. You will hear a lot more from, from Jörg in a few minutes. I just wanted to remind you from this that uh, India is everywhere. This is what we are building. So it's a series of accelerators, first linear accelerator, then uh, these are the existing ones, and these are the one, the new ones which are being built. And you see the Indian flag is not put by random, it's put in areas where a significant realization of components is done here. And you can see that it is almost everywhere. And uh, and this is a big thing, and you will see in pictures in a minute. Two million cubic meters of, of soil to be moved, 600,000 cubic meters of concrete, 65,000 pounds of steel. And this to do a very broad program that goes from the understanding of the structure of protons and neutrons and other atoms to the structure of nuclei, to the nuclear astrophysics, which is what I dedicated most of the time to explain. The structure of nuclear and of matter at extreme density, these are where neutron stars are, and this is where we are going to go explore. And by the way, this experiment, the one that goes for a neutron star, 
would not exist at all without the India scientific community that was inspiring uh, communities for this. And then, of course, atomic physics, biophysics, plasma physics, material physics. And this is how it looks now. Uh, and you see, this is what is being built. This is fair. And this is the existing laboratory, which is GSI. And the question is, why did we go build there next to GSI? Well, because GSI is one of the best nuclear physics laboratories in the world already. If you look at the table of the elements, six of them have been discovered in uh, uh, GSI. And actually, since when you discover an element, you have the right to give it the name. There is an element which is called Darmstadt, Stadium from the city of Darmstadt, where the laboratory is. And, and there is a Hassel from the state of Essen, which is the state where the laboratory is. This is a laboratory which has already more than 50 years, and therefore it, it offers the backbone for the construction of the new one, which is thought done then by a large international community. It is owned by the Orange Chambers, so you see, it is one of the owners of the laboratory, and then it's, uh, it has scientists involved from all the uh, blue ones. And uh, of course, there is uh, a lot of uh, India in there in terms of technologies, in terms of science. I, there are 27 institutions and a number of industries which participate in this project. They, basically, from everywhere in India, you all know, Frankfurt led by uh, uh, Calcutta because of the presence of, of both the Institute and of the ECC which are uh, leading in this whole, in this whole process. And, they, uh, and I told you, local, local activity here in India to realize components that then get put together with those produced everywhere else. So these are chambers for neon detectors which are at the ECC, we saw them we saw them yesterday in construction, uh, detectors for nuclear physics, industrial components for the accelerators, very many of them. And uh, actually, most of the Indian contribution is in terms of realization of components here. And we just see that uh, pictures of them uh, from different companies uh, all over. And then the humans. Remember always. Basic science, knowledge, technology, and talent. And this, and there are, since the start of the project a few years ago, there's been more than 100 young scientists from India that have spent longer or shorter periods of their uh, education at, on, uh, at, uh, at there. And uh, so that has been serving as a back and forth place for people from here to uh, develop their knowledge and come back and continue. And uh, I would like to conclude so that this century is witnessing a scientific landscape which is shaped by this very large international infrastructure. And uh, that can only exist through collaborative efforts that make them combine their expertise. And India is actually not participating, but leading in many of this. The Indian scientific community has embarked in this extraordinary journey, which is, goes beyond national borders, emerging as a key player. Not, I repeat, I said it many times, it's not a participant, leader. It's very different in a number of international mega science projects. And this clearly places the Indian scientific society, uh, community and high-tech industry in a central role in shaping science at the world level. With this, I close and I let you show you how this is actually built.
ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Professor Gregorino for his mesmerizing and insightful lecture. Thank you, sir, for making all of us, especially our young scientists, aware of not only the role that nuclear physics plays in society, but also the critical role of big science in providing an enabling environment to the young researchers who not only showcase their own talent, but also learn from others who come from faraway lands. He aptly termed these international collaborations as talent factories. Thank you very much, sir, for all of us at Bose Institute. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being here today. It's, it's me who thanks you. I'm so much honored to be here. It's been a pleasure, a pleasure, and an honor. Thank you. I now request Mr. Glaura to kindly come up on stage and the speaker to be. I, I request Mr. Gora to kindly felicitate Professor Bugolino by presenting him with the podium. I also request him to present the speaker with two books. The first book is titled An Appraisal of J.C. Bose by Otto Kvasu. And the second one is titled D.M. Bose, a Scientist Incognito by Professor Shukruka Shroy and Virginia Singh. Both books provide comprehensive insight into the life and works of Dr. and Professor D.M. Bose, the two individuals who have provided us the strong foundation upon which our institute rests our today. I now request the chairman to kindly deliver his address. So it's a pleasure and an honor for me to have the opportunity to present uh, to you, the important audience, the uh, status of the realization of the project. Professor Gilolito just presented the fantastic scientific outlook, what all can be done. And as mentioned, it is a journey. It's a long journey for this dimension of a mega science project from the original idea to finding all the partners to realization and finally executing the fantastic scientific program which is being planned for. Just as a short reminder before I move into some direct hands on impressions, I think after the basic ideas in the end of the 90s about CARE, which is a fantastic scientific program. It's, as usually, quite some time to define what is the exact scope, what is the dimension of the project, and, of course, to find all the international partners, nine shareholders, being the owner of this facility, and really realizing that. That was done and signed in October 2010, and all these nine shareholders, and India is a leading one, decided, yes, we want to realize that, and we sign an international contract for this facility. 
And after then defining the stages of how to develop that, at that time, already the scientific and the accelerator community was worldwide very active in developing the components. Everybody knows all this, what we have in this facility, is nothing what you can buy from the shelf. It's all specifically developed for FEA, with a lot of collaborations, many components coming here from the Indian community, the scientific and technology community, to develop these specific items, just as one example, CBM mentioned, or vacuum components, or power converters, numerous components of high technology, which require a development over years. So in summer 2017, we started on the construction side in Darmstadt, so six and a half years ago, with a ground breaking ceremony. At that time, there was simply sand outside there with a few concrete piles in the ground from a basic design. Now, I would like to guide you through a drone video, which uh, is from November, so from this month, uh, which shows inside, outside where we are, and also some of the components being delivered. Just for your orientation, here is the existing GSI, with here the existing accelerator of GSI, and here the ring accelerator this 18, which you have seen in the presentation of Professor Giubilino as the blue uh, area, blue marked scheme of the existing GSI accelerator. Here is the connection from GSI to FAIR. Here is the MIS 100 ring accelerator, 1.1 kilometers in the circumference and deep in the underground. So this ring accelerator area here, this tunnel, is uh, on the bottom part up to minus 20 meters in the ground. And the concrete walls are two to two and a half meters thickness. And please keep in mind that this is not only one tunnel, it's two. There's an inner tunnel and there's an outer tunnel. In the outer tunnel, there finally the accelerator will be installed. And in the inner tunnel, all the utilities for operation of the beam line are installed. For example, the power converters from India, since they have to be protected and separated from the beam line area due to radiation. And in between these two tunnels, there's roughly a shielding wall of nine meters of concrete. So this is all mega and massive. And if you then have the ring accelerator here, here, a large central building, which is a transfer building where various beam lines are on various levels crossing and are fed to the southern area, which is this one, going here to the large experiment areas. And here you see, for example, one important element this is the CBM building. This is CBM where all the colleagues, and we had the pleasure to visit uh, yesterday. Some areas uh, are working for to install finally the CDM experiments, but we are all looking forward. So, this is a very rough overview uh, of the facility. And here in front, you see another thing we have superconducting magnets. So, we use helium in order to cool uh, the wires, basically, so that we have superconducting capabilities and are able to the small uh, wires to put roughly 18,000 amps through to create the magnetic field for uh, managing or for keeping the beam on the beam line. So, and for that we have a large facility for helium and this is installed and done and waits now for commissioning. So I move forward a little bit in the video.
What you see here on that top is the path towards blue star. So what you see here is the high energy cave where blue star will move in and where components like R3D and other components are already in use at GSI in a precursor fair phase zero program, they will move in to this cave so that they are ready and available. This is another cave. This is the upper cave. We are finally upper will move in. You can see in the meantime, things are coded, things are ready. And the next step is to bring in all the installations to make the buildings fit for use, which is in the northern area much more advanced. This is an important point. This is a beam line coming from GSI, this aping, towards the transfer building. So in the middle, and now we are on this staircase made of concrete. We are climbing down to this 100. On this staircase, all or numerous magnets will be installed to bring the beam coming from GSI in a horizontal way, and then going down to minus, in this case, roughly 14, 15 meters, since below that is concrete. And then we have the 1.1 kilometer ring accelerator, ring accelerator in the level of minus 16, 17 meters. So we are going down now, and now we accelerate through the tunnel. And this is also an important view. You can see this is a ring tunnel in which we start next year in February to bring in the first this 100 magnets. So it's an important point where we are. We are finishing the civil works. So end of this year, and we are at the end of this year, concrete works are done for the scope which is defined. The installation of Technical building installation like heating, ventilation, cable trace, everything what you need to make the building functionally is in the area of this 100, mostly done. And now we are getting what is nice. We signed uh, this morning this company Sikhium from India a special contract in terms of cables. These cables will be delivered second quarter next year, and then we bring in all the cables. And, and in parallel, we start with the installation of the ZIS 100 magnets. And this is here exactly on this beam line in the accelerator tunnel. So this is the outer tunnel. Now we speed up 1.1 kilometers. This is an important point. Here is the extraction from the SIS 100 towards uh, either to the southern part super fragment separator or to the CBM area. This is the area where various uh, transformers will be installed. This is the area of the transfer building where the beam lines are crossing. So you can see here the area going south. The beam will come up here and will go down to the south to super fragment separator. And in the area below, it will turn left and will go to the CBM cave. So all this is in the phase that is happening up there. And you can see overhead trains, uh, cable trains, many things are already installed and will be step by step built now. So the facility is becoming real. This is a, 
a refined route for the southern area. Here you have the chance if you are standing now in the CBM cave. This is a CBM cave where seal structure is installed. The hardest experiment the existing one will be positioned here. The CBM dipole magnet, which we order next week, will be positioned here on a, another big foundation, which will be poured next year. And here, where you see these openings in the ground, there will be the rail system for the CBM experiment to open this experiment. So that is all there. You can see we are ready to do that. And step by step, with all the experiment groups, this will be realized. This is the helium system. This is large magnets, each roughly 30 tons, superconducting magnets, which are in this case coming from a company from Italy. They are serving the superfragment separator towards Houston. This is a warehouse. We have nearby rented some kind of a warehouse. There are several thousands of boxes of materials in and hundreds of magnets, what you can see various types. There are also the power converters from India stored in the moment. So from next year, step by step, we will start bringing in uh, these components into, for example, this is 100 tunnel in other areas. Here you see the cryogenic facility, uh, the cold box area where all the helium is uh, produced. As I said before, this facility is fully installed. In the moment, uh, it is conservation performed so that in 25, when we have done all the other installations, then we will commission this machine for this area. And in parallel, we will procure the helium which is currently, as some of you may know, uh, a challenging task to have this amount of helium procured in the world market. And that is what we start next year to do so that we buy them in charges. So, I think what is important, what you as shareholder and contributor should know is we are finishing end of this year concrete work. We are in the installation in the buildings in terms of making that usable. In the northern area, 95%. In the southern area, we start next year. And we start from January, February next year, accelerator installation. You can imagine that we have a huge demand for people during the construction phase who have interest and want to learn in the accelerator installation and then in the next years in the commissioning. So that's also, uh, an, let's say, a call for all interested young people in their career path, whoever wants to contribute, we are open and happy about everybody who is interested to support in this phase. And that's a great knowledge to gain. And also our willingness that we established for the operation phase of there a group of substantial amount of people from the Indian side as a shareholder, 30, 40 people as a permanent team which is rotating there. By that, there's a continuous learning from the operation, there's a continuous exchange of knowledge, and also a continuous work on knowing each other, working together, and further deepening the long standing collaboration. And finally, all what we are doing here is, as outlined for quite a little bit, is finally a cutting edge technology. Many things are new, and it is the human beings working together with their knowledge who finally make this happen. And we are on a great path. We will finish, I think, accelerator installation in 27. So then we have end of 27, we aim at having the first beam 
this early science. On end of 28, we want to have beam in the wider scale, including CDM. That's our objective. There are for sure a lot of hurdles on this space that is normal for a mega science project. And until now, we managed to solve all them. And with this spirit, also from you, what you are doing here with many challenging tasks, all the time there's a challenge, there is a solution, and together it will be solved. So we are very optimistic about that, and we are looking forward for the collaboration and further joint work on the success of the airport. So, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving us a glimpse of the mega project that FAIR is. I now request Professor Uber Bondabadhan to kindly come up and stage and felicitate Mr. Gaurav. and Mr. Gaurav to kindly take their seats. We will now be presenting the, handing out the presentations for the oral and postal presentations that are taking place for the last three days. So the time is here. And many of you are waiting with bated breath. So it, it's an honor, joy to, for all the faculty members and the staff of both institute to recognize the contributions of our researchers, the hands and minds which drive our labs. So uh, for those, our guests, let me tell you that each year, Bose Institute holds a three-day in-house symposium titled Recent Trends in Natural Sciences on the 27th, 28th, and 29th of November. Scholars pursuing research at the Institute communicate their science through oral and poster presentations. And just as an encouragement and to foster scientific excellence, each year we give special recognition to only some of the presenters in both the oral and poster presentation categories. As recognition of their excellence, these researchers will be gifted a book this year. I request the speaker, the chair, and Professor Bhantopadhyay to kindly take positions in the center of the stage. We have 15 recognitions to hand out. So all three, oh, I'll ask all three dignitaries on stage to kindly participate so that we can do this quickly. So I'm going to first call out the names of the uh, oral presenters who are being recognized. First, Pratika Borar. She is from the Department of Biological Sciences and works under the supervision of Dr. Tharabi Kolde. Her presentation was titled Dual Specific Autophosphorylation of IKK2 Enables Phosphorylation of Substrate Alpha B Alpha through phosphorylase without requiring ATP. Pratika, congratulations.
So all uh, our students will be receiving a certificate and a book term in the realm of books. Thank you, Pratika. The second recognition goes to Shona Banerjee. Again, for biological chemistry, she is in the laboratory of Professor Koshi Vishash. His presentation was titled Understanding the Molecular Basis Underlying the Epigenetic Regulation of GM2 Synthase Gene Transcription in Cancer. Sure. Just to mention that these are names in random order, not in order of the marks. Next, Romy Patacharji from the Department of Biological Sciences, who is in the laboratory of Professor Akhil Kumar Mangal. The title of his presentation was Molecular Chaperones, HSP70, HSP1110, Handles Misfolded Proteins in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Next, Aurumi Mitro, again from the Department of Biological Sciences, under the guidance of Dr. Onkoma Ghosh. So, since Aurumi is not here, may I request uh, Dr. Ghosh to kindly accept his award on his behalf? Why you are giving to her, not to me? <laughs> if you want, we will do that. <laughs> But then you would have the responsibility of passing it on to all of you. So that's <laughs> <laughs> So Orly's talk was discipline the biological functions of small proteins in the cerebral medias. Onirudha Tiwari. Onirudha Tiwari is from the Department of Chemical Sciences in the laboratory of Professor Joyce Mukhopadhyay. He gave a lecture on mechanism of delta-mediated transcription activation in vascular subtilis, integration of the alpha CTD of RNA polymerase stabilizing delta, and successively facilitates the open complex formation. And the last student receiving recognition for oral presentation is Shubhodit Masanta from the Department of Physical Sciences in the laboratory of Professor Asinto Shingo. His talk was titled Monolayer Grasping MOSSE Van der Waals Heterostructure, a promising platform for a highly responsive broadband near infrared sensitive far fast photo detection. We'll now move on to the recognitions for poster presentation. Trisha Ghosh from the Department of Biological Sciences in the laboratory of Professor Srimanthi Shortkar. Her poster was titled Multiple Paralogs of Alpha SNAP and NSF Discharge Non Carotinical Parasite Specific Roles in GIDA Lapia. <laughs> Raghuveer Singh, Department of Biological Sciences, in the laboratory of Professor Pallav Kundu, for poster entitled Regulation of Defense Responsive Genes by Microorganism Shaping Pathogenesis in Tomato.
next, Dr. Deepanita Mukherjee in the Department of Biological Sciences from the laboratory of Professor Koshi Vishak for poster title pro tumorigenic role of the ganglioside GM2 through modulation of fibroblasts in tumor microenvironment. Chakraborty from the Department of Biological Sciences in the laboratory of Professor Shubhra Chow for poster and value insights into a novel streptococcal drug target involved in the biosynthesis of capsular polysaccharides. from the Department of Biological Sciences in Professor Shukra Postal's Kudal's lab for poster entitled Mechanistic Insights into the Allosteric Activation of TAC1 using Enhanced Sampling, MD, and Machine Learning Approach. is from the Department of Biological Sciences in the laboratory of Professor Pablo Sundu for investigating the role of cellular factors in the regulation of stress responses with productive development related miRNA biogenesis in tomato plants. for fine mode aerosol chemistry over a semi-urban region at Eastern as Indo-Gangetic Plain, a study under different meteorological dispersion conditions. <laughs> Deep Nath from the Department of Physical Sciences in the laboratory of Professor Shoman Roy for information, gains, and graphs.
lot of you after you have led us through this whole thing. May I request Professor Shantar Bosch, Chairman of the Foundation Day Committee, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Okay, so this is the last job that I have to do as a chairperson of this committee, and it's a most difficult job for us to do that. Uh, Foundation Day is uh, uh, the day for us, the most important day for us. But it's not the one day, you know, it's the it's a whole week that people have been busy and the whole preparation starts quite some time back. So the people who make this today successful didn't do it just for this day. They have been working very hard for almost a month with the uh, aims with this 30th and 30th November. This week starts at 26th November, all of you know, it starts with DM Bosch lecture. Then we have this three day student program, excellent program. All the students did well. In fact, I was surprised. I mean, this was really uh, excellent presentation by all the students. And then we have a today, the foundation day, uh, which people are working even overnight to make it a success. And such days, these days, they can be successful. Because the whole institute comes behind, comes together to make this program successful. Be it account, be it administration, be it the people who are other people who are contextual and also working in the background, all of them, each of them have worked over, overnight and day and night to make this program successful. I'm not naming a particular person, but let's give thanks to our people from administration and account. All of us have this gap of a life. He really worked hard to make this successful. When you, when you talk about this, uh, this program, as I said, that we have the people who are doing this job here on the, on the stage, the electrical people, mind, sound, and all those things. But when you come inside the gate and you start looking at those you know, flowers everywhere, that was our students. They did it. For the last few days, they have worked really hard to make this each and every campus a beautiful place. So let's thank once more for our students. I specifically will uh, will take three names. I have to take because they made so many phone calls that I have to take their names. These are Shimonti, Onupama, and Jumu. I think you guys should. Stand up and show them your face because everybody needs to thank you. You will be willing to stand with you. Okay, everybody has to be your face. Yeah, they are the leaders, they are the you know, mass mobilizers who actually make this thing happen by mobilizing the whole forces of student forces to make this uh, beautiful for all the campuses of beauty. beauty. You know, Timothy, I'm not thanking her separately because you know how excellent job she has been throughout. Uh, but this whole program has could, could not have been a success for two different uh, you know group of people. One are the you people, the spectators, who without you, I mean, you, I must thank you that you are at the end of the day you are here and uh, see the call. So let's first thank all the spectators because they are here and they are listening to. People again, as the most important, our guest. Again, I, we must thank you for coming here because you, because other than that, uh, because of you, the whole lecture was possible. So, can you just stand one more? We'll give one more hand. <laughs> so, I know the whole day has been a challenge, so I will stop here and maybe. We should thank the director also. He is here. Not to do thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ghosh. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to bring the curtains down on the 107th Foundation Day event this year.
May I request this assembly to kindly write for the national anthem?